Second Chronicles, chapter 36. Second Chronicles, chapter 36. There's a writer, an American writer, who focused on, um, or he had a trinity of work concerning the Great Depression um, in the United States in the 1930s that actually affected large parts of the world. And um, what is possibly considered his magnus opus, his greatest work, is the book called East of Eden, the author being John Steinbeck. East of Eden. It's quite a, I think it's made it to a movie as well. And this name, the name of the book, East of Eden, comes from scripture. I've always, I would love to ask him, I'm not sure, I've not read anything in his biography whereby to establish his understanding of this. But it's a wonderful phrase that comes from Scripture from the earliest pages. And you'll find it the moment that man betrayed his creator king, betrayed his maker, and God exiled the man and the woman from his temple garden. And we're told in the third chapter of Genesis that God put at the east of the garden the cherubim and flaming sword to stop the man and the woman and humanity from coming back into God's close presence. And that phrase is repeated again a couple of times more. And that phrase came to define humanity's existence outside of the will of God, outside of God's presence, away from God's presence, in an existence that is now characterized by misery and death. And right from The chapter that follows in chapter 4 of Genesis, we read of what should have been the closest relationship ends in murder with Abel and Cain. And then in the fifth chapter, I cannot just, I know we're in Chronicles, but just humor me for a moment. Just turn the page of your Bible to Genesis chapter 5, because I don't just want you to hear me reading it. I want you to see it. I've always said to us, we tell you this all the time, the men that God used to put the scriptures together wrote with precision. And they wrote with pattern. They wrote with a purpose. These are not just a bunch of desert hats. Some backwards people. But what you see is deliberateness, intentionality in their writing. Watch this with me and tell me what comes to you. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but there's a refrain in this chapter. And it's done deliberately. And only concerning one person in the whole chapter is this refrain not attributed to And it's something that we all can relate to. And by the way, it's something that's going to happen to all of us, 100% of us here today. In fact, let me be prophetic. It's going to happen to everybody. Look at this, Genesis 5. I'm just going to read the first five verses. Then I'm going to touch on a refrain so you get what's going on. Look at this. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. 
male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness. Excuse me. After his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after his father Seth were 800 years. And he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 900 years and 30 years and he died and he died look at verse 8 and he died look at verse 11 and he died verse 14 and he died verse 17 and he died Look at verse 20. And he died. Next one. Nope, didn't. He was translated. Look at verse 27. And he died. Verse 31. And he died. Right there, the author wants us to know this is the new reality this is what it means to live east of Eden this is what it means to be exiled to be kicked out of God's presence and then when God called his people called a people out of all other peoples to represent him and show his glory on the earth he warned them listen you step out of line I'm going to exile you as well. And that's what happened with the nation of Israel. And that's what we're going to concern ourselves with, with the history in the book of Chronicles um, today. And God warned them. And God said, I'm, I'm, I want to live amongst you, to fellowship with you, to be with you. Because remember, the central line of the Bible is this, I will be their God, they will be my people, and I will dwell amongst them. And God says, but if I, if I dwell amongst you, I'm going to kill you. Because I'm holy, you're not. So God made a way whereby I could live with them. And he dwelt with them in the temple, well, the tabernacle, then the tent, later the temple. And that temple was to be a reminder of the Edenic temple garden where God and man fellowshiped, met together. But what happened? They went after idols and God exiled them. And we'll look at this in a bit more detail after we've read our passage this morning. But this is the thing. The whole of humanity, all of us, we're currently living east of Eden. And the plan is, the great plan is to regain paradise. Remember I told you that Greek word, paradise, is actually, especially if you look at the Septuagint, is the word for Eden. That's what this is all about. And when you read Revelation, what do you see coming out from the sky? The new temple garden where we, and, and, the, refrain, and the, the, the proclamation is, God's dwelling place is with man once again. But in the meantime, we're born, we live, and we die. If you disagree, I mean, there's lots of cemeteries around us. It's a constant reminder. It's a constant reminder. Our bodies fail us. Young people, enjoy your body as it is now, because it gets worse. All the old people, yeah. Amen. 
Things go south. Things don't work anymore. Your mind, wants, your mind thinks you can jump like five meters. The reality is you can't even skip. <laughs> That's what's going to happen to you. Right now you fall down, you get up. When you get to a certain age, falling down is a whole different game. <laughs> but the point of the message today is this. Even in the times of deepest, darkest despair, the Christian always has grounds for hope. Amen. This, is, this, is, this is ours. And the title of our message today is When Hope Was Born. Because we're not left in that misery. We're not left in that darkness. We're not left there in a, in a helpless and hopeless situation. Hope exists. And that hope does not exist in a system that you can abide by or follow, but it exists. That hope is a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 36. Sorry. I'm just checking you're awake. You see, well done. You passed the test. Second Chronicles. See, old age. Second Chronicles, chapter 36. And it reads, The people of the land took Jeho- Jeho- sorry. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. Then the king of Egypt deposed him in Jerusalem and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried part of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in the palace in Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations that he did and what was found against him, behold, they are written in the books of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king And he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the precious vessels in the house of the Lord and made his brother Zedekiah king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah, the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. All the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful following all the abominations of the nations. And they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and and on his dwelling place. 
But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed the young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young men or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasure of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And he burnt the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all his palaces with fire and destroyed all his precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword and they became servants to him and to his sons unto the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land and enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord, stu- the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you, of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. This book of Chronicles is quite a unique book. And it's one of those books that sadly people don't bother with. And if you're reading through the Bible as it's laid out, You've read through 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. Then you come to Chronicles, you're like, wait a minute, we've read this before. And you think it's a repetition. But actually, it's not. And the key to understanding the book of Chronicles is, is to understand the authorial intent. Because the author is doing something with the information from the book of Samuel and Kings. He's taking real facts, but he's ordering them in a specific way. Why? Because he's got a particular message to convey. Now, the context of Chronicles is this. Remember, the history of Israel, once they entered the Promised Land, They wanted a king under Samuel. God gave them a king, Saul, naughty king. And then God raised up his own man, a man after his own heart, the adulterer and schemer murderer David. Right? Because that's what he was. Right? Just like us. But God said, my man, And God said, this is, I'm going to establish your house and bless you. And you're going to have a son in the throne forever. Anyway, Solomon comes along after David and he builds God this temple that's based in Jerusalem because the tabernacle used to be in Shiloh, but David brought it to Jerusalem and and he finished off his father's plan to build God a house. But remember, the history is this. After Solomon, the 12 tribes were split into two main nations. The northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom, I've told you this many times, 
the dynasty changes, different families. But what happens in the southern kingdom called Judah is that the line of David is never corrupted and the dynasty never changes. So God sustains the messianic line all the way. And what's happened is this, is that the writer, and in fact, the book of Chronicles is retelling the whole history of, of Israel right from Adam. It actually starts, the first word in Chronicles is Adam. So he is retelling the whole story, the miserable story of humanity and then the story of the nation of Israel. But then what he does, he narrows it down from the whole nation of Israel to focus on Judah and to look at David's line. Because the two main things that he wants to draw out of, of Chronicles, the two main things that he's trying to convey to them is the promise of the Messiah, number one, and the promise of the new temple. And this book was written to those who came back after 70 years. Jeremiah prophesied that 70 years they're going to be in exile. And they're not going to come back a day before that 70 years. And that's the context for the passage that everyone quotes Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you and all of that business. Yeah, you don't want the exile, do you? And all the suffering. But God is saying, no, I've got a plan. And part of that plan is this. You're getting kicked out of the land and if you try to fight it, you're actually fighting me. You're not fighting Babylon or Nebuchadnezzar. You're fighting me. So shut up, sit down, plant vineyards, get married, live, because that's where you're going to be. This is me. I'm doing this. So when they came back from exile, under the king of Persia, under Cyrus, this, these are the people with God's precious promises. God would raise up this king that rule over all kings. They will be over all kingdoms. God's covenant people. And they came back to the land. To begin with, not everybody wanted to go back. You'd think they would all want to go back. And they're like, yeah, um, you know what? Things are good here for us in Babylon. Things are quite good here in Persia. Um, we've got air conditioning. You know, life is good. I've got a thriving business. I don't want to go back to all that dust and rubble. And it's true. They came back. Only about 50 or 70,000 people returned. And they came back and the whole place was desolate. And the people raised this question. Where is God and his promises? Where's God? Where's his promises? Things didn't look too good. God is almighty. God is our God. Look at the state of the temple. Look at the walls. Jerusalem once was beautiful. Now look at it, miserable. So this person chronicles his motivational history. He's trying to remind them, hey, do you remember the northern kingdom? They were taken into exile. They've not come back. We don't even know where they are anymore. But look at it. He's preserved the line of David, Judah. And according to the promises of Jeremiah, we came back. So God's plan is still in action. God hasn't forgotten us. Everything he promised, he's still going to fulfill. That Messiah King is coming and that new temple will come. That's why the book of Chronicles was written. It's, it's revised history focusing on all the great points and that, that David's greatest son is coming. And like David brought so much glory, David's greatest son 
will bring a glory unsurpassed. That's why Chronicles is written. But it was also written to warn them. Do you, know, do you remember what happened to our forefathers and the kings? Because what happened was this. They'd even forgotten. Some of them never knew what the law was. They'd never seen the scroll of the law. In fact, in one of the places, they found the book of the law. And they were like, what is this? That's how much they descended that's how much they, they backslided. They didn't observe the Passover. They didn't observe the Sabbath. And it's one of the... In fact, there was a... There, in God's word, in the law, it said, every seven years, they were not to touch the land. Leave the land, let it breathe. And the reason God did that was to say... Trust me to provide. It was almost like every seven years, I want you to remind you, all the blessings you have is because of me, not because of your agricultural skills. But as a way God is testing to say, will you trust me to provide for you in this desert? By the way, whenever you read a land flowing with milk and honey, you expect to see like lush grass and fields now it was rocks and stones. And in, in the midst of that deserty rocks and stone, God blessed them. But they didn't listen. And that's why God worked it out mathematically. 70 years. All the years, you didn't let the land breathe. You didn't let the land rest. And you didn't trust me. I'm going to let the land take its rest now for 70 years while you're out of the land. So Chronicles was written to warn them, don't be like your forefathers who were stubborn, stiff-necked. Don't be like them lest you be exiled again. And that brings us to our text. Three main subheadings this morning. There is no hope. There is hope when hope was born. That's it. Let's look at the first subheading there is no hope. I want you to think for a moment. You're in the sea, you're drowning. And no matter how good a swimmer, even in turbulent sea, you will only last so long. Then somebody sends out a lifeboat to you. And you reject the lifeboat. You'd be considered an idiot, wouldn't you? Who rejects a lifeboat in a hopeless and a helpless situation? That's exactly what these people did. Let's look closely. Verses 11 to 21 here. But I'm going to bring it down to just two verses. You know, that does not always mean a short sermon. But just two verses I want to to concentrate on this morning. Verse 15 and 16. Look with me, verse 15 and 16. It says, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. And what we have here is real warning. You see, God wasn't just a meanie, a divine meanie, and just was angry, just turfed them out. No. God is a good God. And he sent them real warning. We're told, look at it again. You see, there can be no hope 
when there's persistent, willful rejection of God's word. Let's remember that. There can be no hope when there is a persistent, willful rejection of God's word. We're told here, look at that. They mocked the messengers of God. They despised the word of the Lord. And we still do that today. I mean, look at us in this, in this chapel this morning. We've become used to this because this is our culture as Christians. But to everybody else out there, it's a strange thing, and it should be a strange thing, because worship here is ordered for Christians primarily. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you're taking part in our culture. What we're doing here is strange. It's not normal. This Sunday morning, people are either having a lion or something else. But they're not standing here gathered, singing these songs. It's weird. Songs that you would once upon a time laugh at, it now has great meanings for you. That's what the Holy Spirit does to you. Changes your heart, has new meaning. Look at that, look at this place. You're mixing with people you ordinarily wouldn't mix with. Right here in this chapel, it's a beautiful thing. I always tell you this, and I mean it. I love you people. But if it wasn't for Jesus, I would avoid some of you. (laughs) Right? You'd probably avoid me too. Despite my coolness. But see, this is what Jesus does. So this is not normal. And then you, you sit down for about an hour to hear some Jesus shout at you. Because you need to be shouted at on a Sunday morning. It's not normal. And then we, we say this book does something. It's not normal. So people mock this. They laugh at it. But it's nothing new. They did it with Noah. Noah! Mate, what are you doing? Building an ark. What for? <laughs> well, something bad's coming. <laughs> 120 years. All those years laughing and mocking at him. You're still building that thing, Noah? Yeah, yeah. Imagine Mrs. Noah's girlfriend's group. Oh, your, your husband's really embarrassing. Why don't you have a word of him? His sons? Come on. Shem. Ham. What's your dad doing? You don't think there was some family squad with dad? Why are we building this thing? Just shut up and knock the nails. But this is what the world does. We must also remind ourselves the world hates God. But God hates us, what scripture tells us. We're enemies of God. It's the beauty of the gospel that he loved us at our worst. To call us his children. And we're told the end is always destruction. Look at that. It says, unto the wrath of the Lord Rose, I love that expression. Until the wrath of the Lord rose against them. Against, and this is the thing. Not just against them, but against the people. Not just against the people. Look at which people. Who's anyone? No, his people. Until the wrath of God rose against his own people. Christians, you don't think God will give you a slap down. You're you're ripe for rude awakening. God disciplines his own. And he says, but here's, here's the frightening part. Until there was no remedy. 
until there was no remedy. Do you know what that's like? I sat down with people who get the news, you're stage four cancer. There is no remedy. You're staring death in the face. I remember Uncle Ethel, when him and I sat down and he was given that, and the next few months are so precious. Is there hope even then? Oh yes, always for the believer. This is our joy. This is what we proclaim. But this sentence of judgment by God upon them until there was no remedy. You know why? Because they didn't listen. They didn't listen. They carried on willful rejection. God is sending them lifeboat after lifeboat in the form of this prophet, that prophet, this prophet, the next prophet. They killed them. <coughs> they mocked them. They chased them out of town. And an imagery of what this looks like, look back in, in the same chapter, look back in verse 11 to 13. Look, it's right there. We're given an actual life illustration of what this looked like, what, what happened. Verse 11. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned, what? 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. Look at that, verse 13. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. You see, what happened was this. Nebuchadnezzar came to town and said, and this happened a lot. They come along and they'd be like, slap you down, just show you how strong we are, how stronger than you we are. But we'll let you keep, stay here, we'll let you stay as king or governor, but swear to us loyalty. And that when we've gone, you will do things you know, according to the way we want it done. No rebellion. And it'd be like, we swear. Then the moment the king leaves town, some people would try to scheme. And Jeremiah said to them, listen, guys, God is going to do something and he's the one doing it, even though he's going to use a foreign king. So don't fight it. Yield to it. Then it will go well for you. But they kept mocking Jeremiah and many other false prophets were like, No! We're God's people! This is Jerusalem! No matter what happens, God won't destroy Jerusalem. God won't get rid of his covenant people. Jeremiah is full of nonsense. And Jeremiah kept pleading, saying, Guys, it's going to happen. And there were two ways of the exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And they still didn't learn after the first one. And these nations, they were brutal. They take out your eyes, all right? You want to listen? Pop out your eyes. Maybe now you listen. Put hooks on them and drag them half naked across the desert. These guys were brutal. And just, that's what they did to send out a message. Don't mess with us. If we're being gracious to you, submit. If you won't, we're going to be really brutal to you. The nation before them, the Assyrians, before they even talked to you, they would come in and take a whole place like Velcom and impel everybody. Just to send out a message to the nation. This is how bad we can get. But they didn't listen. And God was almost like, 
I will take care of you in the midst of this nation coming to take over. Just do as I say, but they fought now. We'll get an alliance with Egypt or somebody else and we'll take over these guys. And they got slapped down. Stiffened their neck. We're told they, they stiffened their neck. And this comes from a, um, agricultural um, language or farming language of, a, of driving an ox or um, a horse. And you put a bit of bridle in the horse. And sometimes what a horse would do, I've actually seen this happen, be naughty or stiff in his neck and it refuses to be turned any other way. I remember we won a, 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 like a youth camp in primary school, the last year, no, second to last year primary school because there was a year above us. And I remember that because of this girl called Barbara. I never, here I am, knocking on 15, I still remember Barbara. This one girl on this one trip, boy, she had three accidents. Been stuck on the abseiling, getting stepped on by one of those big shy horses and broke her foot. But this one, she went all pony riding, horse riding, going through the forest. I remember seeing the horse go, you know, start neighing. And then it just turned its neck. And Barbara, I don't know what was going on in her mind, thought she was some skilled horsewoman and starts yanking, right? We, we, were, we, were, we were taught what to do. So I was just yanking at the horse and the horse thought, I'll show you. And they just turned and just took Barbara right through the forest and started galloping. And all you saw was this body doing this, this screaming, right, hands in the air. And we were laughing. We should have been laughing. I feel bad to this day. But we're like, that's what kids do. We're laughing at to see this girl just be carried through the forest, senseless, out of control. Because the horse just stiffened his neck and says, nope, I'm taking you for a ride. And this is the imagery. These people will not be turned. They stiffened their neck. In other words, this is the course I'm going on and I will not be turned. And sadly, that course is one of destruction. If it's not God's way, it's always destruction. In other words, when a person settles in their mind, they're not going to listen no matter what. You know, we all do this, kids. No, 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 no. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Some of us still do it as adults. But that's what they were doing to God. And Zedekiah rejected God's messenger, Jeremiah. A rejection of the authority of God's word. And it still goes on today. We still question God. We still want to argue with him about what he said. What's a man? What's a woman? What's a man's place? What's a woman's place? We still want to debate it with God because, you know, we're equal with God. And, you know, God just doesn't know some stuff. So we want to school God. Don't do that. You will always lose. Like, big time. It won't go well with you. In fact, the fact that we're living east of Eden is evidence that it's not going well for us. Whenever we choose our own way, like we did in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was representative of man's desire to be self-autonomous, to redefine the terms of God and to do whatever he wants to do and to be his own king, the master of his own destiny. How's that going for us? And this is what they were doing. Remember the writer of Chronicles. He's summing up the whole history of this nation and of humanity. And he's showing us, like a mirror, this is who we are. We're stiff-necked people. And a hardened heart is a heart that repeatedly, like a calloused hand, when you get calluses in your hand, it's because of repeated action. And that's the same of our hearts. 
when our hearts become hardened, it becomes callous because of repeated action against God's way. And then you know what God does? He leaves you to your own devices. He says, you want that? Have it. Have it. I've told you before, one of my friends, who was smoking, sneaking, you know, his dad didn't want him to smoke. So he used to buy a pack of cigarettes, you know, smoking, and his dad caught him one day. I, I, I remember, I'll never forget it. So his dad says, you want to smoke? So his dad gave him money, he said, go down to the shop and buy two packets of cigarettes. So he bought two packets of cigarettes, sat him down at the dining table, and says, here's the lighter, smoke a, smoke, smoke a stick. And he's like, I don't want to smoke, Dad. He says, you don't smoke a stick, you're out of my house today. You love smoking, don't you? Start smoking. So he smokes the first stick, he finishes it, and his, his dad says, another stick. And it's like, Dad, I don't want to smoke. He says, no, you do. So take another stick. He smoked about seven or eight sticks, one after the other, and his, and his, and his skin started to change color. He's visibly sick. He ended up vomiting, and he was ill for like a week or two. And his dad just sent the message, if you want it, you can have it. What he realized was, it wasn't a good thing. In fact, he never smoked again after that. And in 586 BC, God acted in Jerusalem and took them and kicked them out of the land, exiled them. And we, we see this, this same warning and plea, even from the mouth of Jesus. So don't feel like this is a big Old Testament God, because people try to do that. But listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 to 38. Jesus said this, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers a brood under her wings? That's the compassion. And you were not willing. And then Jesus said, See, your house is left desolate, abandoned. The glory is gone. We get warning after warning. There has to be action. We see it in the World Cup, don't we? Yeah, we're not going to talk much about it, right? It's very painful. The feeling emerges abroad this morning. Portugal, England, that we will meet afterwards and we're just going to solve one another. Okay? And the, the rest of them mocking us. You know, don't worry. We'll console one another. But you see, don't you? You ever watch? Just watch the, the mouth. You can tell what they're saying. Even the expression on the face. You know what's going on. And a referee would be like, oh, stop your nonsense. And then sometimes they call the captains and say, hey, talk to your players. Otherwise, if he keeps doing that, I'm going to have to give him a yellow card or do something, right? And after a while, you would get one of those one or two players who just don't listen. Almost goad in the, 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 the referee. And sometimes the referee will say, listen, shut your mouth, play football, stop your, you know, be, be nice. Sometimes they use stronger words. Be nice. And I remember w watching one referee turn around and, he, and then he turns again because you know the player says something. And the ref turns around and it's like, right, yellow card. And you know if you carry on, he's got to reach for the back pocket. And when you reach for the back, back pocket, what comes out? The red card. Right? If he's still up here like, oh, yellow card. But if he reaches for the back pocket, red card. 
But it's all, if, if, even in, in that, there's, there's gracious warning. Stop it. Play nice. Play football. There comes a point when the red card must come out. So the exiles who returned are responded to the instruction by Cyrus to go up to return. They would have returned to the wreckage of Jerusalem because their forefathers did not listen. See, your house is left to you desolate. But there is hope. And funny enough, the hope is found in in one of the verses I just read in verse 15. There's hope in there. And we'll look at another passage as well. But there is always hope. There is always hope. This is how gracious God is. If there was no hope, history would have ended a long time ago. Because we see it in Genesis chapter 3. Just after they tried to dethrone God, the same God they tried to dethrone, He comes looking for them. They don't go looking for God. He's the one that comes looking for them. Adam, where are you? First missionary. And then God preaches the first gospel message. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will crush your head, you will bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 And then God graciously takes away their fig leaves and provides proper covering for them. Look at verse 15. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. See, the chronicler um, has some unique information that you won't find in other books like Kings or Samuel. Like, like Manasseh. Manasseh was a nasty king. He was a nasty guy. In the other books and the kings, it just ends, it was evil, dead. But the chronicler recalls for us that he repented. It's, and it's the only place you hear about Manasseh's repentance. That he did repent. The same Manasseh who turned his nose up at God, who bought other idols of all the foreign gods, when he was captured and he was brutalized, he remembered the Lord God of his fathers and he called out to him. And he said, and the Lord heard him. It's a, that's massive what I just said. Go and read up about Manasseh. The Lord heard even him when he repented. While there's breath in you, there's hope of repentance. But how long that breath is going to be in you, I do not know. And you don't know. Look at that persistently. That word in Hebrew speaks of rising up early almost like morning by morning. Conveys the idea of the passage Tebohor read for us. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New every morning. I'm singing the song, right? Great is your faithfulness. That, that, that's the image being conveyed in the Hebrew here. It's this persistent, it's this always morning. It's like God eagerly, right? New day. Mercy. Mercy. Eagerness to show you mercy. <coughs> He's not a meanie God. 
We still think His mercy and grace. But we spurn Him. And we spurn Him. And we spurn Him. But that spurning only goes on so long. See, the suggestion by the author is this. It's almost like it was with great reluctance that God brought disaster on his people. It's like God is holding back from having to judge. I will judge. I will kick you out of the land. And because we take God's patience for weakness, and we take his patience as a license to keep sinning, and we take his patience as grace, as license to continue in error. No, he's just a compassionate God. And that's the only thing you should take from it. And his compassion should lead you to repentance. And let me, let me prove what I'm, what I'm trying to make. Because you see, God set a limit on his wrath. Look at verse 20 and 21. Look at verse 20 21. It says, He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons unto the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. You see, until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. Read on verse 21. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, listen to this, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, all the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. It wasn't going to be forever. Until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath, then I'll let you return. But also, look at this. This is what God does in his plan of salvation. And we and I should be, this is why our worship should be so elevated and vibrant. And we should perpetually be in a state of wonder. And sing grace, grace, grace. (coughs) Proclaim his mercy. (coughs) And never tire of it. And this should be what should propel us to tell others and invite them in that they too may partake in this. Because this God shows that he's not just the God of Israel, but he's sovereign, he's king of all. Read Psalm 33 when you get home. Because that's what it does to Cyrus in it. God's sovereign ordering of pagan kings to accomplish the salvation of his own people. And even Cyrus acknowledges Yahweh's sovereignty in his own actions. Look at that, verse 22, 23. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, you see, it been prophesied about in Isaiah by name. God named Cyrus. His name is there. And when Cyrus found out that years ago some prophet from another nation spoke about him by name, he, was, he had his mind blown. Couldn't believe it. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and look at this, and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. This is beautiful. There is hope. But then hope was, hope came. Hope has come. Hope is here. You see, in the Jewish Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, 
in your Bibles, that was the, in the Bibles we have, what's the last book of the Bible? I mean, I mean the Old Testament. Malachi. 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 Good. In the Jewish ordering, it's Chronicles. And that makes sense. It's the last book written. They came back from exile, and that book was written. And it was written to encourage the people that, listen, God is still our God. His promises shall be fulfilled. So it ends with Chronicles. Now, if you look at the last words in Genesis, Joseph tells them, when that time comes, when you leave Egypt, take my bones up from here with you. And actually, there's few words Joseph, Joseph speaks there. In the Hebrew, it's actually one word. And also here, in the last verse, we read this in last verse in Chronicles. It says, Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. And in the English, well, the ESV is four words. Let him go up. If you look in the original manuscript, in Hebrew, it's one word. Up or arise or vuka. That's it, it's one word. But it conveys a lot, if you understand Hebrew. It's actually three letters in Hebrew, one word. Up. But in English we have to put a bit more so it makes sense to us. And they've got the right rendering. Let him go up. Let him respond. So it finishes with Chronicles. And the Jewish people are still waiting, aren't they? They don't believe in our Messiah. They don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. Well, they're waiting for the Messiah, but they're still waiting. But the Messiah has come. And his name is Jesus. And he's coming again. And that's how the book of Chronicles is, it ends deliberate that way. Up! It's a funny way to end a book. But they were waiting with expectation. Messiah will come. In fact, when Jesus, time he came back, there was already a, 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 a fervor amongst the people. They were all expecting some kind of something to happen with the Messiah. And there were quite a few Messiahs that come and gone. People who claimed to be a Messiah. That was the context. But the New Testament begins with the birth of hope. In Luke chapter 2, we read these words, which we read every year at Christmas, with the man, old man called Simeon. In Luke chapter, so Luke chapter, yeah, Luke chapter 2, from verse 28, this man Simeon. God had told him he wouldn't die until he, with his own eyes, saw his, Israel's salvation. And in verse 28 we read this. He took him up in his arms, that's the baby Jesus, and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. And Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 tells us, And you shall call his name, what? Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You see, church, we are all weary. People don't, some people don't realize the reason why they're not happy is because they're an enemy of God. They, they live in East of Eden. They don't understand that they're outside of God's word. They're an enemy of God. They don't understand that. We have to tell them. <clears throat> That's our job. 
Pastor Dave last week brilliantly well observed and good point. We think that all non-Christians are just miserable and oh, because they're not believers. Oh, life. Now, some of them are having a good time actually. Doing very well. <coughs> we need to tell them that no, all is not well. And why? They need to hear from us. And we need to show them that they're actually in danger of something terrible. So the New Testament begins with this hope. You and I are weary. Life is tough. Right now, even in South Africa as a nation, we're going through some very difficult times, aren't we? Now we're what? Four hours at a time load shedding? Yeah? If you spoke to some people 14 years ago, that 14 years later we'll still be having load shedding and it's going to get worse. People would have laughed at you. I can tell you that actually because that's what people did when I told them. Because you know what? If you're not doing anything to fix the problem, the problem remains. 14 years of load shedding, by the way. People don't realize that. 2008. But that's just one thing amongst many, isn't it? There are many other issues. Broken families, fatherlessness. And I can go on and on. Is there hope? There is. I told you at the beginning of this message, that's the point of the message, that even in the darkest, bleakest time, for the Christian there's hope. Hear me clearly, for the Christian. If you're not a Christian, you don't get to do this. And our message for you is repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there will be eternal destruction and a destruction that you will never die from. But a body will be prepared for you to suffer an eternity in hell forever and ever and ever and it will not end. But the New Testament begins with this hope in the, in the form of the person Jesus. And this Jesus lived a perfect life. And this Jesus stood against temptation and won. Unlike Adam and Eve and the nation of Israel, this Jesus was obedient to God to the very end. This Jesus fulfilled God's plan and purposes as he went to the cross to bear God's wrath against our human sin. This Jesus rose gloriously and victoriously from the dead for our justification so that we who are wretched sinners get to stand before a holy God and not get blighted away. We get to stand before him as not guilty. This Jesus then ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the majesty of high, on high, the right hand of God, the Father, to forever intercede for the saints, for those who are his. This Jesus is building his temple, his church, all over the world. And this Jesus gives us real hope because he's coming back. This Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. I will give you rest from the beating that sin and Satan and the flesh and the corruption of this world is visiting upon you. I will give you rest. There's a way out. I'll give you, there's not even a cheat code. It's a demonstration of the power of God. I will give you rest. This Jesus 
has ended the exile from God's presence from his temple garden Eden paradise is no longer lost to us as we come to Jesus the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end they are new every morning great is his faithfulness this Jesus was born to give us hope but but not if you reject his word if you continue to stiffen your neck the Bible says no hope no hope if you listen to his voice today real hope and we can say together with Cyrus up let us go forth and proclaim the glories of our Lord and our King I'll leave you with this stanza from the hymn we're going to finish with today I was going to choose that's we all like that Carol in fact Chad introduced it to us when hope was born this night but it's too easy you know we pastors like to be a bit complex show our biblical intelligence Joy to the World written by Sir Isaac Watts and I think this verse wonderfully encapsulates the hope that we've been talking about in this sermon and you know what when you google joy to the world it gives you pentatonics the celtic women and all of these other good kind of versions renditions of the carol and you know sometimes they shorten their songs and they always leave this verse out see if you see why they leave it out I don't know, maybe it's deliberate or they don't know what to do with it. But this is the verse to leave out. No more let sin and sorrows grow or thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings known far as the curse is felt beautiful when Jesus came the real hope that's exactly what he came to do that wherever that curse of sin is Jesus on the cross and by his resurrection has dealt it a death blow sin no longer has power over us sin is no longer we're not, we are no longer defined by sin, but Jesus. That's us. This is our hope. This is our joy. And that's why I'm going to invite you all together in a couple of minutes to stand and sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let's pray.